Jenna Engel loves the oboe. She has built her business on providing high-quality, handmade reeds, education, and a sympathetic ear to oboists across the country. When you order from Jenna Engel Reeds, you get prompt communication, reeds or cane handcrafted to your specifications, and cheerful, friendly customer service. All orders are mailed within one week, sometimes much faster. Single orders or monthly read subscriptions are welcome, and she'll work with you to find the combination of response, resistance, stability, and flexibility that is right for you. Jenna doesn't just do reads either. Look at jennaingle.com for a selection of read cases, swabs, and tools, or for read making videos, classes, and boot camps. Podcast listeners can use the code DISH for 10% off their first order. That's DISH, all caps, at jennaingle.com. Ugly Duckling Oboes is dedicated to the development of young oboe players. They provide quality handmade oboe reads, private lessons, and high quality oboe sales, rentals, and consignments. The oboes that they rent are conservatory mechanism oboes that include the left hand F key and low B flat key. All are maintained by oboe specific technicians. In-person lessons are available as well as virtual lessons for students who live outside the geographic area or have transportation or schedule challenges. They also offer online college audition coaching for high school juniors and seniors who plan to audition to be music majors. Visit UglyDucklingOboes.com for more details on how you can set yourself up for success and sign up for their newsletter. Thank you for your support, Ugly Duckling Oboes. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish. A podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. back in Washington State, back in Pullman, finally. I am. And as we approach back to school, I'm also back in office um, because we were all remote last year. So I never actually Mm -hmm. moved into my new office. (laughs) And um, I have several like posters and programs that I needed to get framed. And so I got our recital poster from uh the concert series in flint that we did with uh super with listener carl. carl carl angelo hi shout out to carl i finally got that framed and so i will go back to school with double read dish on the wall that's right uh so it's like second year first year for you it is it is mm-hmm. and it's going back to in-person teaching for the first time in nearly two years. I mean, I taught at camp, but in terms of like a classroom and being in a new environment, it's like a major reset for me, for sure. Yeah. Well, me too. This will be my first semester coming back tenured. Oh, booyah. Booyah. I got my final letter. It's right over here next to me. (laughs) They'll be like, hey, Dr. K. I'll be like, that's associate Dr. K to you. (laughs) Okay, let's get back on track. We participated in the second annual IDRS virtual symposium this summer as Double Read Dish by hosting a panel called Pulling the Thread. And we know many of you came and that was fantastic. It was so wonderful to see your names in the audience. And um, thank you so much for spending the time with us. But Jackie, tell us a little bit about your experience listening to our incredible guests and how, you know, how that's affecting you coming back to school, back to in-person reality. Yeah, I mean, you and I have been doing kind of a lot of reflection individually and in our friendship about the way forward, things that now that we're further in our career, looking back, messages that were helpful and messages that were maybe not so helpful that we've Mm -hmm. had to intentionally unpack, skills that we got from our education that were especially helpful and skills that we've had to seek out on our own to kind of fill the holes in our education or as we make more individualized careers that we end up needing. And so I've been doing a lot of reflection on who I wanna be as an artist, but also who I need to be as a teacher 
to my students to prepare them for what I think is going to happen as we continue forward out of this pandemic and for the decades to come in our field. And so one of the things we wanted to do when we were talking about proposing, because um, we love to do a live show at IDRS and we'll continue doing that and we will continue having fun. But we also didn't just want to be the girls who play games and we wanted to contribute in a more significant way. And so we thought, how can these things all inform one another and how can we reframe this concept of expertise? And so looking at the option of doing a panel through that lens, we thought, wouldn't it be so great to highlight some of the people who already are and have been doing the stuff that we're just thinking about now? And so we said, hey, let's build a panel around this idea of it's not a problem to pursue an orchestral career. It's not a problem to pursue a higher ed career. We are both in higher ed. Mm -hmm. but." these are not the only options and we must 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 divest from the idea that there are two paths to success validation and respect in this field and instead view the bassoon and the oboe as an amplification tool with which to do the work that you think is important and mm -hmm. contributing to the world in which you live and so we had mm -hmm. four guests Francis Colon, Alex Davis, Aaron Oft, and Jessica Wilkins, who we thought exemplified that, you know, just spectacularly. I don't know, what was your experience? I was really inspired. Alex Davis talked about how music has become a source of healing and how he was able to take his skills and offer healing to himself and to other Black and Brown musicians in New York City. And, um, that really resonated with me that, a lot. And I think that for a long time for me, and if it's true for me, it's probably true for a lot of people that music is a, often not a place of healing. It's a place of anxiety and stress and trauma and harm. And, you know, I'm a very anxious person, Jackie. I don't know if we've met before. <laughs> But the pandemic has helped me in a really odd way to let go of some of the unrealistic expectations I had for myself and for the people around me and to allow myself a space where it's okay if you make a mistake, it's okay if, you know, you're not at your best right now, but the focus, and some of this, of course, is tenure privilege, but the focus for me going forward is going to be fostering a place of healing and health in lessons and in studio class mm -hmm. and encouraging creativity and having a much lower emphasis on demanding perfection mm -hmm. and listen a lot more to the people around me, especially my students, you know, and recognize that their journey is their journey and they can take that in whatever direction feels the best for them. Same. I'm not a particularly anxious person in the way you are, but I've made this feel harmful to myself in um, seeking validation from it. If I reach that mm -hmm. tempo, then I'm good. And mm -hmm. if I achieved all of these gold stars, then that's a reflection of who I am, Jackie the human, and I'm deriving all of mm -hmm. my self-worth from the gold stars that I earn through playing the bassoon and having the music that I make be far too much wrapped up in my identity. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of two different approaches, but... Uh, just kind of needing to reframe. Same thing. The pandemic allowed yep. me to slow down enough that mm -hmm. I was able to kind of give some deep thought. And actually, this is very type A, but this summer I intentionally spent time in reflection and research and surrounding all these ideas developed and wrote a personal praxis and from that praxis or personal philosophy, I guess you could call it, crafted a strategic plan 
for myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, just basically action items that hold myself accountable for having the performances and pedagogy and starting the conversations that I think are important to have, because it's really easy for, you know, days to turn into weeks and what do Mm -hmm. I need to put on this recital and to Mm -hmm. not necessarily have a thoughtful or insightful career, which is, I guess, not the biggest deal, but it, it can perpetuate some of the things Mm -hmm. that we were talking about Mm -hmm. and slowing down made me realize how important it was to not do that. So I'm really proud that we used the panel as a way to do that. I anticipate my work going forward will continue these type of conversations and whatnot. And um, you posted something the other day Mm. that was like super inspiring to me and just really encapsulated kind of these feelings that we've been discussing a lot. And I actually asked you if you would read now for the internet you reading assignment (laughs) so this instagram account is called inspired to write and here's the post artists are not like athletes we cannot win gold we cannot beat other creatives we cannot come first sport is objective our craft is subjective creating to quote be the best is a waste of energy Instead, create to connect to the people who need you because they're out there. Create in your way because there is no right way. Take the pressure off and focus on your unique brand of magic. I love it. Just show up as yourself in this art and you are enough and you're inherently special and worthy. It's both centering and decentering yourself Absolutely. at the same time. It's like you are worthy of finding creativity and joy in what you do. And you are also worthy of taking yourself out of the center of the story and not being the main character of the story all the time. Yeah. And as you always say, if we're coming at it from this perspective of individual worth and contribution, then a field that we are told has much more supply than demand suddenly has room for all, which is pretty darn cool. Let's make it so. La la la. <laughs> hey, oboists! Have you ever found it difficult to sort out when and how to find a new oboe or English horn? Oboe Chicago streamlines the process, providing personal and professional consultation and a large selection of lovely instruments. The process feels comfortable and thorough. Selection includes Effleuré of Paris. Howarth of London, Covey Oboes, and Fox Products. For a current listing of Obo Chicago selection, please visit www.obochicago.com. For a credit of $100 towards shipping, mention Double Read Dish when you call or email Shauna. That's obochicago.com. Chemical City Double Reads is a full-service double read shop specializing in the sale of instruments, cane, accessories, and sheet music. Double Read Dish listeners can enjoy free shipping with code DRDISH. Visit them in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or online at www.chemicalcityreads.com. We are delighted to welcome to Double Read Dish, Jonathan Fisher, Principal Oboe of the Houston Symphony. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. We love to start by getting to know our guests by hearing about how they started to play their instrument. So how did you come to the oboe? Um, okay, let's see. I, I grew up in my early childhood in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and the string program is really big there. And so I was kind of all set to um, enter the string program, and I was going to choose cello, and my parents were musicians, and I grew up in a house of musicians. My father was the music director of the Asheville Symphony. Wow. Yeah. And he taught violin at Converse College. And then my mom was a music therapist and they both taught at Brevard in the summers. And so I was like a faculty brat at Brevard as a kid. <laughs> and they like would rehearse their recital stuff all the time. So there was just music in the house all the time, but it was very like piano strings. And I was taking piano lessons from my mom. My dad was pushing the violin. I was didn't, I was not into it. And I wanted to study cello. Um, but then the summer before third grade, my father died in a car accident very suddenly. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And so we moved 
quite suddenly, like weeks later, we moved to North Carolina because my mom got um, a professor job at East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina, not to be confused with Greenville, South Carolina. And she figured that would be like the better job as a single parent. So we moved like over just really fast there. And there it was all banned all the time. Like the string program existed, but sort of it, the people we knew um, was sort of the band world. So my mom had a church job. Well, I should back up a little bit. When I was a little, little kid living in Spartanburg, my oldest brother um, was a violin student at School of the Arts in North Carolina. And we went to a recital that he played on and there was an oboist. And I remember just being mesmerized and I can't believe I, you know, now thought this. And I was like, wow, that looks so hard. I want to do that. It looks <laughs> so easy. And look at all those buttons. And, you know, little did I know. <laughs> it really was. Reads, and that it really was. So I didn't say anything. Like, I, we just went home and carried on with our lives. We moved to North Carolina. And I just had this, I just like harbored that somewhere in my brain that I just loved the oboe. And then, and I must have been like five or something. I was pretty little to have a thought about the oboe. <laughs> and um, we moved to North Carolina. My mom um, was the organist at this church. And so she would make us go every Sunday. And this woman who was in the choir uh, was also the band director. It was a small town in the school I was going to. So we were at their house one night having dinner. And she said, well, next year, you're going to pick your band instrument. What instrument do you want to pick? And I said, oh, well, definitely the oboe, obviously, you know. And <laughs> she kind of flipped out. She was like, really? For real? You want to play the oboe? I have one. Don't move. Stay right there. And she oh. turns out she had been an oboe major in college. You know, she was music ed, but as an oboist. And she um, brought this oboe out, soaked up a reed, and like I honked out a couple notes. And like that was kind of how I had my first oboe lesson was at this dinner party at her house. In front of everyone. In front of, well, it was just like my family and them. Oh, so okay. It wasn't <laughs> like a fancy dinner party. Was, you know. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it started. And then I just started in the public school band program because she was my band director. And we met in like a portable trailer behind the school and played our fifth grade band music. Yeah. That is so lucky. Yeah. It was really lucky that she just happened to be an oboist. And then she, after a while, you know, she sort of graduated me to the te the oboe professor at East Carolina, who at the time uh, was David Hawkins. And he was, he had grown up in St. Louis. So he studied with Woodhams as a high school, when he was in high school. So I feel like I just had really great fundamental training from the very, very beginning. You know, just really good teachers from the very start, just from dumb luck. So you went to your teacher's teacher, Richard Woodhams, at Curtis. Yeah. So um, it wasn't quite, it was a little bit of a meandering path. So I studied with David Hawkins for a couple of years, and then I really wanted to go to the North Carolina School of the Arts because my brother had gone there. And the town was really small where I lived. We had a youth orchestra. Um, I was a founding member. Where, like I was there when it started. So then it was like little and I was the only oboe player. And, you know, David Hawkins, he tried to include, like he let me come to the master classes at ECU of his college age students and everything. Like he really tried to include me in like the oboe life at the university. But I still just was like, I didn't really have a proper orchestra to play in and blah, blah, blah. So, but I was in the ninth grade and my mom was like, you're too, you can't go. You're too young. Uh, you can't go. You can't go. And I nagged her and nagged her and nagged her. And I don't really remember this, but she told me that the day that she finally decided I could go, she opened her closet door in the morning and I had slipped a piece of paper under her closet door that said in like a poster board and big markers, I think I'm mature enough to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> relentless it was relentless <laughs> and she, she was just like all right already so she was like all right he must really want this she's like who is this monster that yeah. I, I want him out of my house <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness so off i went that was like second half of ninth grade i did ninth and tenth grade at school of the arts then i did 11th and 12th at interlochen and then when I graduated, I'm the youngest of my siblings. 
So I was the last kid to graduate. And um, my mom then moved to a different job. She got a teaching job in Canada. I It was a senior at Interlochen, and I um, auditioned at the, all the usual places, and I didn't get in anywhere. So she said, well, you can come to this university in Canada that I'm going to teach at for free. They had this deal. And I said, okay. And I, at that point, I was really like, well, clearly I'm not going to be a professional oboist because I can't get in anywhere. So I got waitlisted like at, I don't remember, Eastman, Cleveland, Oberlin, maybe. I can't remember. It's funny. I can't remember because at the time it was quite traumatizing. But now it's like, ah, whatever. Yeah, I didn't get in anywhere. So I went to her. I was kind of questioning if I was going to even do music because I didn't get in anywhere. So I kind of just went to this university. I took a broad spectrum of classes. I took like Inuit archaeology and all these other like interesting kind of things. But the oboe teacher there was amazing. This guy, Jim Mason, who studied with Delancey, who got me sort of all excited about the oboe again. And... So I did all the uh, big audition circuit round again, and I again didn't get in anywhere. And then I got my very, yes, and then I was like, okay, the universe is speaking to me. I'm gonna be a flight attendant. No, I thought, (laughs) um, that's my secret dream job. Oh. (laughs) I mean, I'm half joking, but only half. Um, So anyway, I got my final, letter the last letter to come was my acceptance letter to curtis so curtis was the only place i got in wow yeah i had to go there it was it's funny because now i think it's funny like now it's like a claim to fame but at the time it was terrible i was traumatized well i remember like being in high school and going through the audition process and it feels like absolutely everything is riding on these decisions and it's determining your future value potential. Like it's determining, yeah. it feels, it feels so heavy. And then like, look at your career since then. I think that's totally fantastic. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, I, and I drank the Kool-Aid, like I bought into the idea that like, well, I didn't get in anywhere, so I should listen to that. You know, that means I'm not cut out for this. And then I got into Curtis. So I thought, well, what the heck? I guess I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say no to Curtis, right? Like, you have to go if they take you. So, I mean, I'm just <laughs> grateful that what I saw a potential in me that others didn't. I'm just, like, eternally grateful to him for that. Can so. I ask you kind of an offshoot question? Sure. So every once in a while, a student will ask me, like, do you think I'm good enough to make it? Mm -hmm. Do students ask you that? And based on your experiences, how do you respond? I've never had a student straight up point blank ask me, but I have had, you know, various, I've had the conversation with students. I try to be honest. It's pretty case by case because some students are very clueless about where they fit in to the like zeitgeist of American oboe playing and others really underestimate themselves. I think, you know, probably based on what we were talking about on signals they're getting from outside things saying they're not good enough. And so I've kind of had to have every, it kind of just goes the whole gamut. I've had to tell really great students who want to not do performance or don't think they're good enough, you know, to really who want to change. I've had to talk them out of it and be like, no, 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 you can do this. I've had the opposite also true, you know, kids who could barely put it together, who thought they would like to be in the Boston Symphony. That sounds Mm -hmm. fun. You know, kids Mm -hmm. like that who just had no idea and sort of everything in between. But I've never really had someone just ask me, you know, do you think I can make it? But I don't, try to like lead them down the garden path. It's tricky. It's a good question because it's hard. It's a hard conversation to have, but I really think there are a lot of ways that you can have a career in music that don't, that aren't playing in an orchestra or teaching in university. There are other things you can do if you still want to be in the arts, you know, and play the oboe. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's room for a lot of different paths and journeys, I think. 
based off of getting those signals and then kind of at the last minute being admitted into one of the most prestigious programs in the country. (laughs) Did you struggle with imposter syndrome while you were a student and then later on? It's a double-edged sword, right? Because I, I kind of feel a certain awe of my colleagues and how it seems easy for them and they're so amazing and I can't believe I'm here. You know, that's, I don't know if that's negative. I mean, I think that's something that keeps you working hard and inspired, but I guess it could be detrimental if you, if it, you know, like invades your confidence to a point where you can't function or something like that. But. Or maybe another way to phrase it would be, you know, if you had kind of come to this conclusion or, or thought that this isn't for me, and then you find yourself in this really prestigious and intense environment what was that experience like for you maybe just kind of tell us about those years yeah i did feel a funny mix of things i felt very excited to go i felt like oh man this all came together and this is where i'm meant to go and you know it's curtis i can't believe it and i was super pumped but at the same when i got there i did feel pretty insecure about it because it was, you know, a lot of the kids at Curtis are from New York. And I mean, I had never seen a building that was over 10 stories tall. Like I was from Greenville, North Carolina. I didn't, and they were talking about stuff I just had no idea about. So it was a, it was a little, I was sort of um, awestruck when I got there. And then, you know, I went to orchestra for the first, the system they have there is amazing. It's four oboes. So your first year you sit fourth chair or assistant second, I guess. And then third, you move up, you know, second year, you move up to third, your third year, your second, your first, your last year, your principals. Like you, there's no challenges or auditions or ensemble auditions or any of that. You just move up a chair every year. Um, so I was like last year in the, in the orchestra and the, I don't remember what the first piece was, um, but that orchestra played and I just like thought, I do not belong here. I mean, it sounds like a professional orchestra, the Curtis mm-hmm. Orchestra. It's crazy. And everyone in that orchestra has a job now. You know, it was really mm-hmm. like a, um, I was there kind of in a good, in, during a couple of sweet years too. I, had, I was with a really amazing group of people. So I did feel um, a little bit maybe insecure and like, uh-oh, uh-oh. But it's kind of forced, I think I reacted well to it. They say it's not what happens to you, it's how you react to it, right? So Mm -hmm. I reacted, um, I just put my head down and thought, okay, I got to keep up. So just work hard, you know, it was, it was really good. And the, the, the older oboe students, when I was there, it was Robert Walters. Wow. And Jennifer Coons, who's amazing. She's, I think she freelances in Philadelphia now. And she's a beautiful, beautiful oboist and a really great read maker. And she, and Robert also, they really like um, took the new, ki- you know, they like helped us. And, you know, it was a very, very supportive. It's funny for the most probably competitive school in the country. It It's not competitive at all once you're in, <laughs> not with each other. I mean, it was the, the Obotus. We were like a support group for each other. We like made oh, reads that's amazing. all the time. And yeah, they really, really helped me. Um, and it was really good to be kind of the worst person there, at least that that was my perception, so that I was just forced to be pulled up by the rising tide, you know, it was, Mm -hmm. it was great for me. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have you talk us through your journey into the professional realm. How did you get to where you are today? It was very meandering. So I'll just start at the end by saying I've taken over 50 auditions. (gasps) So I am an example. I'm an, I'm a, I'm the poster child for perseverance. I was not an overnight success. My first, when I graduated, I went to new world for a year and then I'm after new, I did one year at new world. And then I moved to Toronto because I had this landed immigrant status because of my mom. And there was a, I had some personal reasons for moving there. They had a really good um, freelancing scene there. And I went up there and I, I freelanced a lot and I played a bunch of Phantom of the Opera shows and Beauty and the Beast and things like that. Then my first um, real job was Savannah. Someone had taken a six month leave. He was playing somewhere else. And so I won that job, but I knew it was temporary. I knew it was a six month job. And I just moved there with a suitcase and a bicycle. And I lived in this lady's garage 
apartment. I don't know what I was thinking. After the audition, <laughs> like I won the audition and then I went to, I don't know what I was thinking. I went to the Savannah tourism office where you would get like brochures and maps and that kind of stuff. And I stood in line and I walked up to this woman and I was like, I just got a job and I need a place to live for six months that's furnished. And she said, well, darling, you can live in my garage for $200. And I said, okay. And she said, okay. That was it. That's how I found a place. Um, it was crazy. So anyway, so I played in Savannah for like the second half of the their season. And it was great. I maintain to this day, it was one of my favorite jobs because the wind section was great and the city is gorgeous. I don't know if you've been there. It's I think it's America's most beautiful place. And the orchestra was great. The wind section was great. We played like Mozart octets in the art museum and it was just heavenly. I loved it. And I loved the people and the whole experience. And I couldn't believe that all I had to do was play the oboe. That was my only responsibility in life. So that was nice after being a student. Um, but I knew it was short lived. So I had to move back to Toronto, but then I won um, principal oboe of the Canadian Opera Company. And I played there for a couple of years. And while I was doing that, I was playing Santa Fe Opera in the summers. So I was playing opera year round. Then I won principal in the Lyric Opera of Chicago. So I moved to Chicago and I won Grant Park. So I sort of swapped Santa Fe for Grant Park so I wouldn't have to move. And I really like, or, you know, moved during the summers. And um, that's a great combination, Lyric plus Grand Park, because you've got mm -hmm. half the year of opera, half the year of symphony. Both orchestras are great. Um, it was before the nice new fancy Millennial Park shell in Grand Park. We played in this old little rickety shell with no air conditioning and like some viola passed out during a concert. Viola oh, okay. passed out, it was like a hundred whatever degrees. Um, so anyway, I did that for three years. Then I won assistant principal in Cleveland and so I moved to Cleveland and then this whole Cleveland craziness happened. But I, um, right kind of as that was all falling apart, San Francisco called me and said they had a one year opening and would I come out and audition for that? So I kind of, I was never without employment. I went right from Blossom, got in the car and drove to California and started playing in San Francisco. So I was associate in San Francisco. There were a couple auditions. I finally won that, the permanent job there. So I played associate in San Francisco for 10 years. And then um, I was just itching for a principal job. And so that's when I took Houston and moved to Houston eight years ago, I think now. Oh, wow. That's a really incredible uh, journey. It was a lot. It was a lot of, I mean, I took 50 auditions. I won several. I didn't just win one out of 50. So I did, you know, my average is <laughs> one out of 50, but it's maybe <laughs> eight out of 50, which is not great. So, I mean, it's, you have to take a lot of auditions and, um, they're hard. I found it very hard to take auditions. I found it very unnatural. Well, along those lines, we've had several guests say that you have to learn how to audition and that that's kind of a unique art and um, thing to navigate. So I wonder if you have any advice um, for someone who's like still out on that path, beating the pavement about what you learned about the art of auditioning and maybe even also what you learned from being on the other side of the curtain and listening to audition committees. Yeah. In terms of being the candidate, I would say, um, you know, start the preparation process earlier than you think, you know, if you could start it two months before the audition, something like that, and kind of approach it very systematically. So I sort of make a list, I have my students now make a list of their hardest excerpts, like the big, hard technical ones, the slow, hard for endurance ones, and then the ones that they could like play tomorrow and feel pretty comfortable about. So you have your three lists and then you make a little calendar and you back out a week from the audition because you want to be done practicing at least a week, ideally two, if you have that luxury before I mean, practicing, I mean like woodshedding two weeks before. So you can just run the list and make reads all the time for the last week or two. Um, before that, you kind of back it up and you slot in your those excerpts from those lists. So you would start with like one crazy, like put Tombow on there, crazy technical one that's difficult and something slow 
that requires endurance, Brahms Violin Concerto. You'd put those on day one, and that's the day that those really get your deep dive day of really woodshedding it on the slow ones, deciding every single nuance, every single connection between notes, where you're going to breathe, where the peaks of the phrases are, all that stuff. That's the day that gets the deep dive. Now, those two are particularly hard. They might get two or three days of deep dive. But as the calendar goes on, you keep adding the ones that starting with the most difficult first so they get the longest time period. And once it's on the calendar, it stays on the calendar. So like after you've done your deep dive of what did we have, Tombow and Brahms 1, you're still going to play through those every single day. So the hardest one you've played every single day for two months before the audition. The easiest ones you've played two or three weeks every day before. That's brilliant. Yeah, and then you hopefully get to the last two weeks done with that process so then you can just run the list every day and and just focus on reads, 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 reads. And then just go with a lot of reads. Try to go a day or two before, um, I would say, um, if you can, you know, treat yourself to a nice hotel. <laughs> But, you know, when you're a student, you can't really do that. But, uh, yeah, from the from the committee point of view, and this is maybe something I still don't quite understand. When you're on the, um, when you're a candidate and you get cut, you're like, well, wait, I thought that this was good. Maybe it was that little flub in this piece. You know, you're, you're kind of wondering what you're trying to figure out what it was that got you cut. Did it, you know, was that sharp on that note or whatever? And you're surprised that you got cut. When you're on the committee... It's crystal clear who should be cut in the prelims. And I don't know why when you're a candidate, it's not crystal clear to you that you're cut. I mean, sometimes it is. I've had experiences where like, clearly I'm not going to advance. I'm going to the airport, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been many times thought, oh, well, I should advance. I played well and I got cut. But when you're on the committee, it's we try to pass anyone who sounds pretty good, you know, just to keep right. the rounds big. So I don't, I don't really understand. I think that's a thing about perception and really listening to what you're doing, honestly, and not thinking just about how it feels maybe, or so, there's like a perception thing there. And I would also say that it's never a blip or a turn or a wrong note that gets you cut. It's all is in the prelims anyway, it's always sound intonation or rhythm. Always. It's always like a big picture item. Like either the sound isn't good, then you can play a note perfect audition. You're going to get cut if they don't like the, the, if they're not buying what you're selling, you know? Um, if, the, if there's some chronic intonation things, you'll get cut no matter what. If there's chronic rhythm things, you'll get cut no matter what. Um, and if, and if you play well and you sound good and you screw something up because you're nervous, you can totally still advance if you have a nice sound and good pitch and good rhythm. So I, this, the story that illustrates it is I was playing in auditioning for Buffalo. This was years ago. And I played, I played more wrong notes in Don Juan than there were notes on the page. And it was <laughs> comical. I mean, they must've been back there like, Oh, Oh, <laughs> I don't know if you remember the Olympics. There was the Olympics. It was a long time ago where this Chinese um, figure skater, she fell like 15. Oh dollars. yeah. I remember uh, that. And the commentators were like, she's like, Oh, oh she's back. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, oh. <laughs> and it went on and on and on. That's how my Don Juan was. So, and they passed me, they passed me. So I was like, oh, what am I going to do now? Like, so, I locked my, I had like three hours before finals or something. And I locked myself in my room and just practiced really, really hard. And the next round I played really cleanly and really well and they cut me. So I think you just don't know, maybe I was too careful in that round or the other round, you know, the round where I did it on thumb on the other stuff, I was freer to play. Once I was auditioning for Boston once and I played Beethoven three and I cracked the G at the beginning. I was like, bah, 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 bah. So I stopped and I didn't ask for permission. I just started it again and I did it again. Duh, duh, duh. And I was thinking, oh boy, okay. So, cause if you do it again, the second time it has to be right. I started it a third time, I did it again. And I kept going. I thought you can't stop again. <laughs> you just can't, you just can't. So I kept going and I finished. And then I had this sort of like burden lifted off my like wow I can do anything I want now because I'm done like I'm cut so I just 
settled in and played. They let me play a few more, and I just like enjoyed the hall. And I was like, oh, it sounds so pretty. I love this one. Brahms one. This one's nice. Da, da, da. And they passed me. And I asked uh, Rob Sheena after the audition. He's the English horn player there, and he's like, oh, that was you. You had some trouble with that. <laughs> He's so nice. He was like very sweet about it. He was like, yeah, you had some trouble with that bitch of it, but your bronze was so beautiful. We thought, oh, there's just something wrong with his oboe or something. Like, so it's, not, <laughs> it's not like cracked notes or missed notes. It's all about like good sound, good pitch, good rhythm. That's what you need to get through, at least in the prelims. How do you incorporate all of this incredible, this is an impossible question. How do you incorporate all of this incredible <laughs> like life experience into your teaching. I want to know who you are as a teacher since you uh, teach at the University of Houston. At the University of Houston, yeah. So I'll just plug our program for a second if, you, if I, you'll indulge me. It's, it's me and the English horn player from the Houston Symphony, Adam Dennett. And we, what, how we do it is a little bit unusual and I think really great. He has a studio of, I think he has five at the moment. I have a studio of four at the moment. But then we do our studio, like master class, studio class every week together. And his students play for me and my students play for him. So they get cross-contamination, we like to call it. They get cross-exposure <laughs> between the two Fully of them. pollinated. Yes, fully pollinated. <laughs> <laughs> and then they can do the swaps. So like if a, if a student wants to study two weeks with him or two weeks at English Horn or something, they can ask one of his to swap and do two weeks with me. So as long as our hours come out right, we're happy for them. Can to I swap. just tell you that team teaching is my dream? Is it? Yes. You're by yourself, right? I'm by myself. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to team teach like that. That sounds so great. Yeah, it's fun. And then if one of us has to leave town or like, we've always got a cover um, for things too. And I think the kids like it because they just get double the attention kind of. Not sure. Not, they don't get double lessons exactly, but they do get, you know, I consider his students, I have, I feel a, a, a level of responsibility for his students as well, not just my own. And I know he feels the same way. So we have you know, they have two people who care about them and, and are helping them and we'll do whatever for them. And so that's great. And we'll do these swaps. We've even had, um, I think once we had someone do a whole semester swap, somebody wanted to do like English horn for a semester with him and he found a student who wanted to swap. So um, the reason I say all that is because when you say my who I am as a teacher, we do have, I don't know if he would agree with this, <laughs> probably. We have a little bit of a good cop, bad cop routine. Oh, that I'm sort of the nice one. I'm sort of the like the um, the feelings one, and he's sort of the like if they if they cry like he's called me in lessons when he's had a student in tears about them. <laughs> like I don't know what to do. Let's call Mr. Fisher, and they call me. So they come to me with more of their like you know my boyfriend broke up with me and da, 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 that kind of stuff. But um, together it works. We have like a good chemistry. <laughs> Um, so who, you just who, hand them the tissues from your pocket. <laughs> Here you go, yeah. sir. <laughs> when they want to have like a talky talk lesson, they come to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think I enjoy the students. I feel like um, the I feel like boredom is the enemy of art, and that if the in, if the lessons aren't enjoyable, selfishly for me and also for the student, they're not gonna learn. I'm not gonna be at my best teaching them. So I try to keep it fun. Although I do, I think they would say I hold them to a high expectation. I feel like I'm the king of nice, but I have students graduate and tell me they were always so nervous for my lessons because I'm so intimidating and mean. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I try to be super nice. I say play it again a lot. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. I make them play it until there's not a single mistake. And I insist on that. And then, Ooh. you know, at the beginning of the semester, that takes them by surprise. For me, before I went to Curtis, I really thought that um, you could kind of parse out the different aspects of playing. You know, I, we, my friends and I would go hear some recital. I'm like, well, they're, they were a quarter tone sharp the whole time, but you know, they're so musical or they have a beautiful sound, but they are boring. 
but their sound is great. You know, like we would sort of parse that all out and be like, well, they're good because they have this one good thing, even though these other things were bad. At Curtis, Woodhams was very much, that was just not acceptable to him. And he never, you know, explicitly spilled that out, spelled that out for me, but it was just crystal clear from lesson one, it's all or nothing. Because all those different things inform the other. Like how beautiful is your tone if your intonation is bad? Because the intonation affects the sound, right? If the, those tempered, those those kind of up leading notes and the down tonics and stuff affects the pit. It affects the musicality, the temperament of the intonation. The rhythm affects the musicality and the phrasing. Like they're all, you can't separate them. Mm -hmm. And he, he just was like, no, and you, and you can't play wrong notes. I mean, that just, it's funny that, you know, now as a professional person, it seems so obvious to say that. But when you're a high school kid, you're like, well, that's pretty good. I only played, you know, mm -hmm. wrong notes was like not that big of a deal to me when I was in high school. So that was a shock to me when I got to college that it, to Curtis, it was like it all had to be there. So I try to take that same kind of approach. And it's a little, I think it's a little um, hard for the students the first month or two. So I try to do it in a very gentle way. And in their first lesson, you know, they'll play something and they'll inevitably play a wrong rhythm or a wrong accidental or something. And I'll say, so, you know, your job is to get it as great as you can get it and come to me. Your goal should be for me to say, I have nothing to say. It's perfect, right? So if you, would you say that was perfect? And they'll say, well, no, because I played this wrong note. And I said, aha, so you can fix that. You don't need me for that. You don't need me to fix that. Let's try it again. You know, so I kind of start with that attitude. As the weeks go on, I get a little more, nope, you're not leaving this room till you play this top to bottom without a mistake. And then they, you know, about the third week or so, it clicks in that, oh, okay, he's not messing around. So, mm -hmm. and then they, it really makes a big difference. And then they work harder, they're more prepared. They, you know, so I think I'm nice about it, but I, I am insistent on that. Mm -hmm. um, just that they get it as far as they can get it so that my job is to take it, help them take it further. Woodham's always said that his most important job for me was to develop my aural discrimination, my ear discrimination, so that I could hear myself the way he hears me. So I would know what was wrong and then I would fix it. And he's right because, you know, if you, if the student takes it as far as they can, they don't know what needs to be fixed. The teacher's job is to help them hear better, help them hear what's wrong. Thousand percent. So that's sort of my approach. Um, I'm a little, um, I'm a little bit of a hard ass with reads in terms of I'll, I give them one semester, and after that they can't buy reads anymore. They have to give up their read source, and I'll fix their reads, but they have to bring me even if they're terrible. They have to be their own, and I'll get them. I'll turn them into something they can play on, but they have to kind of cut their source loose. Um, and I, so I've waffled on this, but at the moment, I, I don't make a distinction between performance and education majors in terms of that. They still have to. I've had some people say, why make an education major learn how to make great reads? They're never going to have to do it again. And I, I think they should be able to, and they're going to have to help their students' reads. And I don't like drawing distinctions between the performance students and the education students because it, it always falls into a, oh, well, they're only ed major. I don't like that. It's, you know. Yeah. My my music educator, my band director, Miss Dottie Jo, <laughs> who taught me the oboe in her living room and in the trailer behind the elementary school, changed the trajectory of my life because she was a well-trained, really good musician. Yeah. So I feel like they need, the ed kids need the same education as the performance kids. It doesn't. It's vital. Agreed. Can you talk to us a little bit about your reads? What is your process? They're all amazing. There's no <laughs> <laughs> and where do you sell them? <laughs> I have two. That's it. Um, let's see. My in terms of just setup, um, you know, I went to Curtis, so I, I used a graph. I sort of I'll explain this to you the way I explain it, like when I'm teaching Greek class for the first year students. Um, I think there are kind of this is an over oversimplification. But I feel like there's sort of two, in the States anyway, kind of ways to make reads. One is to 
scrape, get that reed vibrating, get it going, get it going, get it going. Once you've got enough vibration, stop and you're done. The other way is to get too much vibration, get it vibrating like crazy, as much vibration as you can get out of that piece of cane, and then kind of back that up, like corral that into something you could play on physically. So one is sort of tight to loose, the first one I described, and one is loose to tight. And I make reads loose to tight. So I get the piece of cane vibrating as wildly as I possibly can so that every vibration is tapped. And then I try to corral that to manage that. So like my, the final thing I would do would be a clip, not a scrape. Mm. I'm always going from loose to tight. I know other people will go the opposite. And I think you can make a great read from either of those um, very general basic methods. But to me, it may be just the way I conceive of it. To me, there's, if I don't get all that vibration out of the reed, I feel like I'm leaving something on the table. You know, there's some untapped color in that reed that I'm not taking advantage of if I haven't gotten it to vibrate. So I get it vibrating like, just like rah, crazy. And then try to get that to the octave, mostly by just thinning, working on the tip, thinning the sides of the tip, just corralling that down and then put the back in. And then that's that. Usually. I, I love mean, that. In theory. <laughs> Doesn't always work, but yeah. It's hard for me to get that sort of glow or halo, mm -hmm. like glow from within quality in the tone or halo around the tone. If you haven't gotten all those partials out of the piece of cane. You know, if you're just getting it to vibrate enough and then you stop, it might be more stable. That would be one plus, I guess, of doing it that way. And it'll be very sort of, you know, I'm doing air quotes, dark, which I hate talking about tone in terms of dark and light because, you know, but I, I think that approach will get you kind of a um, more seductive tone faster, maybe like a more covered kind of sound always mm -hmm. and, and my what the more vibrant way the reed goes a, a little bit through an ugly stage <laughs> you know you can't put a reed that's vibrating like crazy like that into the you know what i mean there's gonna right. be a point where it sounds like a kazoo <laughs> you have to kind of <laughs> deal with that the other way you never get to that point you know so you, mm -hmm. you it's it's a little more um i think it's more stable maybe less demoralizing in the process <laughs> Ultimately, you can make a stable read from either method. You can make a flexible read from either method. And you want to be right on that fence of stability, flexibility, beautiful sound. You know, I know players who make them both ways who sound great. So I don't, it, I'm not really, um, I advocate for my way because that's all I know how to teach, you know, is what worked for me. But I, I don't, I'm not real dogmatic about it, I guess. I I'd love to look back over some memorable moments from your career. Um, we'd like two memories, if you'll indulge us. Uh, one great special memory, if you look back, and one maybe humorous, embarrassing, or funny experience you've had. Well, a, a good one. I remember my very, my first sort of real job. I mentioned the Savannah job that was, I knew it was temporary. When I got my first job that I knew, like, I can have this job for the rest of my life if I get tenure, my job job, as I called it at the time. I remember the day of the opening night concert, I was upstairs in the office signing some paperwork. They were, like, helping me pick my 403B and my insurance options and all that stuff. And so then later that night, I went to play the concert, and it was Ariadne off Noxos. I don't know if you know. It's this beautiful, beautiful opera. And it starts with the timpani goes boom, 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 boom. And then the curtain goes up kind of right away. There's no real overture. And the orchestra starts playing and I heard the curtain swoosh open and I like got all choked up. And I remember just thinking like, I have benefits. <laughs> <laughs> I have a 403B. Oh. I'm all grown up. I had this like, I made it. I did it. Oh. Um, so that was my like first job opening night, first concert. That's not that heartwarming. It is. It really <laughs> is. Okay. It really is. <laughs> okay, good. Um, let's see. I remember 
San Francisco, there was an earthquake once during a concert. We kept, <gasps> we kept playing. Yeah, we just kept going. And the it was James Conlon. He was on the podium and he kind of put his hands in the air and started laughing. And he was just like, Wee! <laughs> <laughs> the stage was rolling. <laughs> and we kept going. We didn't stop. <laughs> I had a um, just a, like um, two months ago I was playing the Mozart Sinfonia Concertante and I got really bad water in my D hole which is a very unusual place to get a lot of water and I it you couldn't really hear it yet but I could feel it and I sort of heard it in the first movement so between the first movement and the second movement and this was a live stream just to put give you some context so live stream concert. So during the movements, I kind of, it was um, David Robertson and I, I kind of signaled him like, give me a second and I'm fiddling with the paper and I'm trying to get the paper and the paper just, you know, there was so much water. It was crazy. It like disintegrated the paper. So picture, you know, for the listeners, picture like wet toilet paper. It's like, stuck. <laughs> it clumps, like you can't get it out. I put another piece under there, same thing. And there's all this clumping paper stuck in the hole. And I, I was like, I can't get it out. You can't get the paper out. And I'm trying to get my like sausage finger under the pad. <laughs> I couldn't get under there. And the bassoon player was like, do you want pliers? And I was like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Live stream. So David Robertson, you know, he is like, announces to the audience like, well, this is the excitement of live music, folks. And I said, not for me. <laughs> she gives me these pliers. They're bassoon pliers. So they're huge. I can't, yeah. them, you know, like, I was like this isn't going to work. And I was starting to get panicked. Like, what am I going to do? Well, there are oboes in the orchestra. There's two oboes in the orchestra part. So I looked, I was like, I said to David Robertson on the live stream in front of a thousand people, I'm going to need to get his, get someone double from the orchestra. I can't fix it. And the, uh, the second oboist jumped up, ran up to me. We swapped oboes. I, I showed him, you know, it's, there's wet paper in the D key. Try to get it out. He's like, okay. So. <laughs> this is your problem like, now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, it seemed like it took a half an hour and I just w was like praying for an earthquake. I just thought I wanted to die. Like it was so. <laughs> Well, I was more that was not when the earthquake happened, right? That was unfortunately that was oh. not when the earthquake happened. <laughs> so we played that. I played the second movement on his oboe. So you know, I spent a, eight measures like frantically figuring out the intonate. You know, because it's a whole different yeah. thing. And then he he had a little adjustment thing that was not quite right and wasn't working. And there was a variation where I needed that to work. And in the third movement, so I was like, oh, I, I, got, I can't play the third movement on this oboe because it doesn't work. So I'm panicking and I kind of, when I have some rest, I'm looking over at the second oboist and he's like signaling me, you know, you want to switch back for the third movement. And I was like, yes. So then I play and then he's making eyes at David Robertson trying to communicate with him. We're going to need to switch back before the third movement. It was like all this stuff happening. Um, musicians become masters at nonverbal communication. So then before the third movement, we had to, he came running out and we swapped back. And then I played the last movement on mine. And I just thought that's the worst thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, that's horrifying. <laughs> and then I watched the live stream recording thing and it was no big deal. It was like, oh, it was so fast. I thought it took five minutes. It took like 45 seconds. It was so fast. And I looked sort of like, Oh, this is no big deal. I'll just do it on your oboe. You know, I looked kind of heroic almost. Like, oh, okay, no big deal. I'll just, and then I just switched back. And like, like, it looked like no big deal. It's funny. You just think the world is ending when it's happening. But it's, there's a lesson in there. There's a lesson in there somewhere. I don't know. I have one more if maybe you think this yeah, one's Yeah, fun. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it. In the Canadian Opera Company, we were playing um, Salome. And there's a scene where... Salome has to, she spills a fruit bowl of fruit. And they had like a scrim screen thing over the pit. So stuff wouldn't fall in the pit in general. But this one lone styrofoam tangerine made it. And it comes flying into the pit. And it's, there's those like feather light styrofoam things. And it, the clarinet player was playing a solo. And it was hard and serious. And he was totally bald. And it hit him on the head. And it went, <laughs> it went like, like it made that like sound 
And it was incredibly loud as it bounced off his head while he was trying to play. And the bassoon player next to him had rest and he just lost it. He was audibly weeping with laughter. I lost it. The second open player lost it. The flute player, like the whole wind section was down. Like we were all bent over. And um, he had to keep playing. Yeah, it wasn't good. It just... <laughs> That's the funniest thing I've ever heard. I had to play um, ocarina once. The whole front row of the woodwinds had to play the ocarina once. And I think it's Ligeti Concerto for Orchestra, maybe. some. It was some cool piece. I can't remember what the piece was. I wish I could remember. And we all had to play ocarinas. And it was this big thing. We had to practice. And there were fingerings. Like, we had a proper part. And then we never played them with vibrato, <laughs> which, you know, in the, con you know, we played three or four nights of this piece. And I decided one night, well, I'm going to add some vibrato. I'm going to sound good on my ocarina. <laughs> and the problem on the ocarina is if you add vibrato, it sounds like you're laughing. It's like, <laughs> it sounds like you're cracking up. And then the flute player caught it. She was like, <laughs> <laughs> And then we were just like, oh, yeah, it was bad. It wasn't good. <laughs> These things happen. These things happen. We are very serious classical musicians. Very serious. I have no, I have zero poker face. So if somebody starts giggling, I can't play. I can't. The best, I'll tell you the best gig I ever played. I was a Ooh, student yeah. at Curtis. I got this call to play a gig. The music was a D major chord for... 25 minutes and so and it was like a small chamber orchestra we we're like pick a pick a note in a d major chord d f sharp or a and i just checked to make sure that was right yes that's a d major chord and, <laughs> and play, i went to curtis play you know one just the whole notes just like sustain one of the three notes of a d major chord as long as you can then breathe drop in and out take a rest where you need to play a different note different octave whatever you want we just want to sustain d major chord that feathers in and out to, through the different instruments and blah 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 and we were like okay sure I'll, i need 100 bucks i'll do this so we're sitting there playing and while we're playing the d major chord about eight or ten completely butt naked people walk out onto the stage they proceed to paint themselves with sponges, with blue paint, like royal blue, bright paint. So they're co all covered in blue paint. Then they rolled around on a canvas. That w Then they held up this work of art, and then they torched it <laughs> with the Philadelphia Fire Department lining the aisles of the church because it was like a fire code problem. So they can the fire department comes in. They push the thing, and then we stop playing our D major chord, and that's the presentation of the work. And the audience was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, where's my check? Yeah. <laughs> Same time tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> and then they told us that it was, it had been performed in a shopping mall in Paris. I think that was like to make us feel better, that it was really awesome. <laughs> Hard and fancy. <laughs> uh, because we were college kids, right? We were giggling and laughing and sure. you know, not taking it terribly seriously. I mean, it was hard to take it seriously. And then uh, they're like, this was premiered in Paris. Exactly. <laughs> this is uh, capital A they didn't art. Mean Paris, Texas. They meant Paris, France. Oh. So we, you know, okay. I don't think that would fly in Paris, Texas. I don't think that would, no. no. <laughs> Jonathan, our favorite question to end with is what advice do you have for young musicians who aspire to have a career like yours? It's not just a question of practicing and mastering your instrument. I think it's developing yourself as an artist, mm -hmm. which I think sounds kind of high and mighty, but it's not. It, it means read a lot of books, go to the art museum, educate yourself, understand how the arts all inform one another and kind of approach your oboe playing with an artistic sensibility and a sort of poetic sensibility 
that's sort of my advice for someone's internal life. Externally, you really do have to work hard. There's no way around the hard work. Um, buy a sharp knife. That is my number one best piece of advice. If your read making is not going well, it's your knife. Everyone loves to say it's the weather, it's the gout, it's the pain. It, no, it's your knife. Always insist on scraping with a sharp knife. Work really hard. Um, be an excellent colleague. That's a really, really important thing because you, you're going to, the music world is very, very small and you don't know who's going to be on a committee and who, you know, you don't want to be a jerk because it's, it's, it's a hard thing that we're doing. We sit inches away from one another and we're nervous. It's vulnerable. It's hard. You know, you're shaking. They hear you breathing. They, you know, it's, you put yourself out there when you're playing and it, you want to really feel that people are not being judgmental and making fun of, you know, you just, you, you need that support from your colleagues. I feel really lucky. In Houston Symphony. We have a really great wind section and we're all really good friends. And, um, I feel like my job is to go play the world's most beautiful music with my friends every day. You know, it just, it's, um, such a cool thing to do with your life. Love what you do. Listen, listen, listen to as much music as you can. Listen to a lot of singers. I, th I really believe playing those um, six years of opera really helped me. Just listening how singers, what they do with their vibrato and how they vary it so much and how it's like within the sound and not something you put on top of the sound. What else? Persevere. I'm an example of you know, if you take enough auditions, your number will come up and take them all. Take, you know, don't be, don't be embarrassed to go take one, you know, audition for the Philadelphia Orchestra, audition for um, Pascagoula, you know, audition for everything just because the process is the same. And I think like you had said earlier, you have to practice the process and really nothing can replicate I had a teacher that told me like you should run around the block three times and then play your excerpt list to kind of mimic that heartbeat, heart rate, like having to control yourself physically when you're amped up and your heart's racing. I never really tried that, but I, it, it may be a good idea, but I don't even that like nothing replicates the reality of taking the audition, you know? So I think take, take them all, you know, once you're older then you, you know, you need to be in it to win it and really, work hard but um read making i really this is sound advice because i did not take to read making well and i really hated it i found it like sort of a loathsome chore and i heard someone say once um if you can't you know you have to make reads to play the oboe there's no way out of it and this person said you know if you can't get out of it get into it mm. and i thought aha uh -huh. and that is true my, my so now my my read room is nice. It's a room I want to be in. You know, I there's plants in there. Like it, you make, you know, kind of make it, create a good work environment for yourself so that the physical space is somewhere that you want to be. So it doesn't feel like you're going into the dungeon to make reads. Mm -hmm. And try to get into it. Try to pre at least fake it till you make it. Pretend that it's interesting. Pretend that it's crafty. Pretend that it's fun. And it it'll it helps. With, then if you go in thinking, oh, I have to make reads. I hate it. That's not a good way to start. It's usually because your knife is dull. It's usually, thank you. <laughs> you were listening. You were paying attention. It's usually because your knife is dull. Yeah. So keep a positive attitude. Be a good colleague. I feel like I'm rambling all over the place, but. It's all super great advice. Jonathan Fisher, thank you so, so much for joining us on Double Read Dish. Thanks for having me. I was scrolling through and you've had so many esteemed people. I felt very honored that you reached out to me. So thanks. Oh, for well, we're honored that you're willing to so generously donate some of your time and attention and your stories and make me. us scream laugh. You're not paying me? Donate. <laughs> what? what? I thought I was getting paid. Wait a minute. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for that hilarious episode with Jonathan Fisher. What a blast. Please follow us on social media so you don't miss out on any of the cool things that we've got coming up. And uh, join our consortium if you haven't done that yet. There's room for everybody. Galit, who's coming up on the next episode? Ooh, this was a fun one. We 
are going to share an interview with Francisco Jobert Bernard, who is the second bassoonist of the Louisville Orchestra. Jackie, let's end this nerd parade. Go make reads. <laughs>